Next, and last today, we have Daniel, we have Morrow, and we have Jen, who are going to talk to us about smart city stuff and taking over smart city stuff and generally causing all kinds of chaos and havoc. Why don't we give these guys a big round of applause? Hi, everybody. Woo! So, some quick introductions. My name is Daniel Crowley. I am the research baron for X-Force Red. Uh, you might be wondering why I have such a silly title. Well, uh, I wanted to be a director of research because uh, I do direct the research program, but director is apparently a reserved word at IBM, so I had to kind of work around that. I pitched them a couple things, including tyrannical research dictator. They didn't like that. Um, I, I pitched a research sultan, but there was some suggestion that eh, maybe there was some cultural insensitivity there, so we passed on that one. But I do hold, uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I do hold the noble title of baron in the micronation of Sealand, so as long as you respect its sovereignty, well, e mari libertas to you, buddy. Um, but uh, I'm a baron, as long as you don't mind me having paid $40 to get that title. Um, best $40 I ever spent, by the way. Um, I've been doing pen testing uh, since 2004, and I've been a hobbyist before that. And I also happen to have an interest in, in physical security, and uh, I'm a bit of a lock sport enthusiast. Oh, I didn't advance the slides quick enough, did I? Hi, I'm Jennifer Savage. I'm a security researcher at ThreatCare. I'm also a member of the Black Hat Review Board. I've had a couple decades experience in tech, including uh, software development, management, um, vulnerability management, vulnerability assessment, penetration testing, security research, etc. I'm Mauro. I've been doing pen testing for many years. I've been passing through different areas like secure architecture, developing. Uh, system administrator, and I love to find flaws and correct them. So you might be kind of curious about the term smart city. What exactly makes uh, technology smart city technology? Well, it's a pretty broad blanket term, kind of like Internet of Things. Um, it's, it's more specific than that, but it's still in the Venn diagram. It's a pretty large bubble, and there's lots of little circles within that. So, um, for instance, there's the industrial internet of things. Um, cities have to have uh, utilities, you know, you have to have water infrastructure and power and all that sort of thing. So, when you have technology running that, that's part of smart city tech. Um, something that fits more squarely into that is uh, urban automation. So, an example being automated waste trucks that uh, drive around and pick up people's trash cans and read RFID tags in the trash cans so that they have an exact log of when each trash can was picked up and which trash can uh, belonged to whom and how heavy it was and all that sort of thing. And then you have uh, public safety things like police body cams. You have things like emergency management systems. Um, so you have uh, systems that uh, uh, detect impending disasters and uh, allow people to respond quicker. Um, you have intelligent transportation systems, uh, um, uh, uh, devices and software that try to reduce traffic congestion, um, things that will detect how much traffic is on a stretch of road and then communicate with the traffic light down the road to say, okay, you're, you're going to want to open it up a little bit. Um, and then you have uh, metropolitan area networks, which are just sort of city-sized. Uh, they're like lands, but city-sized. Um, so you might have public internet kiosks, or you might have city-wide Wi-Fi uh, provided just for all the citizens to use. Um, and there's more smart city tech than just this. There's lots and lots and lots of different tech, but these are different just example areas. So when it comes to privacy, there are a lot of concerns with smart city technologies. Um, it's a very different thing when you can choose what you have in your home. You can choose not to have IoT devices. You can choose not to have a smart TV in your home. Um, but you can't really get much control over the fact that 
outside your home, right outside your door, every street lamp on your street might have a camera in it. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about smart cities. Everything's monitored. There are a billion sensors everywhere. Um, it could become the case that there are legitimate purposes that are subverted by malicious actors. And so if, you know, a legitimate person could use a connected vehicle infrastructure, like a vehicle to infrastructure hub, to monitor the location of a car, or use cameras to monitor the location of a person walking down a street, that um, you know, a malicious actor could use it for the same purposes as well. So speaking of intelligent transportation systems, this is one of the biggest pushes in smart city tech. There is a lot of advancement, a lot of adoption of smart city technologies. Uh, I was lucky enough to speak with a gentleman from the Federal Highway Administration who corrected me a little bit on this slide. Um, so uh, there was, as far as we can find, a proposed OBD3 standard at one point, which was basically OBD2 plus a little transceiver. But the more we looked into it, we weren't sure if it was a thing that was pitched a long time ago around uh, circa 2000 and then died because it was obviously a terrible idea or it might have actually been a hoax um, because we we chased it down and it was some of these things looked pretty odd so uh, thank you to Ed from the FHWA uh, for uh, steering us in in the right direction on that um, so uh, something that exists in uh, Hangzhou China is what's called the city brain or traffic brain, which is a gigantic intelligent transportation systems project that aims to reduce the traffic problems in Hangzhou. And um, as a Westerner, this, this particular quote kind of horrified me that uh, in China people have less concern with privacy, which allows us to move faster. Uh, and that, uh, for context, is being spoken by uh, the uh, the manager of AI at Alibaba who created, Alibaba created the traffic brain and he's speaking about it at a the World Summit AI uh, in a talk about the traffic brain. But it's not just in China. Um, there's also street lights with uh, cameras built into them and uh, it took me a while of staring at this picture before I could actually see the cameras in these street lights but sure enough they are there. Now, in addition to that, lots of cities are either talking about or have already deployed facial recognition software to their surveillance cameras. So in 2017, uh, a former, uh, former governor, red leather, yellow leather, unique New York. Um, a former government official for Singapore said that they want to deploy cameras to every single one of their lampposts, all 110,000, and put facial recognition uh, software to work on those cameras. And if you think that's crazy, Dubai one-upped them. They want to make the first police station manned entirely by robot police by 2030. There was a movie about this. It didn't end well. So let's talk about reconnaissance. How do you discover what's in a city? So you just start with search engines. That's the most obvious place. In fact, everything that you need in order to discover what's in a city can be done entirely through passive reconnaissance methods. So um, we started with case studies made by manufacturers who talked about what their devices were being used for around the world. And you can get some really interesting information about the deployments of those devices just by looking at the case studies. There's also news reports. So local news will quite often cover smart city developments. It's all new, it's all, all fascinating, um, and it's all recorded by the news. And then, um, oh, the open data initiatives. So some of you may have seen a lot of open data initiatives offered by uh, various government agencies, and cities will quite often have their own open data initiatives where they publish data quite often taken from those smart city sensors. And then some city contracts um, are public 
<laughs> I'm looking at this upside down. It's kind of hard. <laughs> so some city contracts are public. So in the U.S., everything's FOIAable. So you can look up a purchase order online. If you just Google for it properly, you can check bid net, et cetera. And then you can see what your city has. So also, public systems are already mapped. So there are some really great search engines out there that are used for um, mapping out internet infrastructure. Um, so if you first identify the IANA ranges for the city that you're doing recon on, then you can just check Shodan and Census by searching literally for that IANA range. There'll be an ID for it. And then lastly, physical recon. So just going outside basically and looking with your eyes. Um, you can do traditional methods like war driving, looking for Wi-Fi. There's all kinds of different war driving methods out there. There's even war driving for LoRaWAN. You can find, I think Travis Goodspeed has some really great stuff on other uh, types of war driving out there. And, um, but all of this requires that you actually log off and walk outside your home. So a bit of a challenge for some of us. And then source code repositories. So a lot of this stuff is open source. Um, you can check GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab. And then lastly, we found this thing called OSADP, run by the Federal Highway Administration. And I was recently informed that they actually are requiring that a lot of these manufacturers open source their software so that independent security researchers can do this kind of work. And it really enables us to try to find these kinds of flaws. So I'm really happy with that. So let's apply these method methods real quick to a city. So Austin, Texas, which is the city I live in, um, here's a roundup of some news reports that were done about smart city tech that was being deployed. So autonomous transit shuttles, um, a smart street, so 6th Street, which is a real big party street there, they were going to turn into a smart street. Um, this is City Up. It's basically a website all about Austin's smart city initiatives, and you can find lots of details there. Uh, here's the census results for the city's IANA ranges. This actually covers a lot more than just the smart city tech that they have. It's a list of like all of the systems that are running on their range. Um, and this is kind of neat. At all of the low water crossings in Austin, they have flood sensors. And these boxes are on the side of the road. And you can just walk right by and see them. Um, and here's how they transmit here. Interestingly, after we started doing our research, and I became concerned about um, whether or not flood sensors might be messed with and nobody would know to go check to make sure it's, it's a legitimate reading, somebody went ahead and installed cameras without us even reaching out or talking to them. They installed cameras at every low water crossing. So now when you check the ATX floods website that reports the results of, of the flood sensor, you can verify it visually to see whether or not the low water crossing actually is flooded. And um, ATX Floods, by the way, is a website you can use to, to uh, plan your route around the city during times of flooding because it floods quite frequently in Austin. And then uh, this is actually just a purchase order we found by Googling for purchase orders, like we said before. And this one's for police body cams, which falls under the safety uh, subset of things. Right, so I imagine some of you are here just for the bugs, so here's the bugs. So the first uh, device, or re rather devices that we looked at were, um, were a, uh, in, in a device family called the Ilon devices from Echelon Corporation. Um, we looked at the smart server, which was previously called, uh, previously branded as the Ilon 100 and its successor, the Ilon 600. Um, now both of these things have the same function but different feature sets. Um, so basically, um, you might know something about ICS security, but if you know anything about ICS security, the general recommendation is never ever attach these things to the internet, ne just like put them in an air gap network and never let anybody touch them unless they are already 
authorized to touch them. So um, we found that this was a pretty interesting device because what it does is it hooks up ICS devices to IP networks like the internet. Um, and actually we found about 450 smart server devices exposed to the internet via census. So that's great. Um, so uh, these things talk to a variety of different devices over various protocols like it speaks to the very popular Modbus, uh, including the uh, Modbus over TCP IP variant, it speaks BACnet over IP, uh, and it can also speak to any sort of web services that uh, 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 take SOAP communications. Um, hooking this up was kind of a harrowing experience for me because it doesn't take, uh, it, it, it has these screw terminals to receive power and uh, I couldn't just cannibalize a power cable, like an ATX power cable uh, and plug in, uh, I had to get like a little power adapter and I, I did a terrible wiring job. I actually, when I hooked this up, I plugged it in on one of my like outside ports on my concrete patio and I was wearing like a, a, a safety goggles and oven mitts because I was like, is this going to blow up? Is there going to be fire? I'm not an electrician. Uh, if there's anyone from OSHA in the room, I'm sorry. Um, I probably did bad things there, although uh, it wasn't at my workplace. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> so, um, so we found a bunch of things here. Um, we found, first of all, that there were default credentials. Um, one interesting thing is that there is a web server and an FTP server, and there are separate credentials for both. So you might have one of these things and change the web server password but not the FTP password. In fact, we sourced one of these devices from eBay and found that while the web application password had been changed, the FTP server password had not. Um, so we, uh, we were able to, uh, because of the fact that the credentials are in a configuration file in plain text on the FTP route, uh, we were actually able to get the original credentials for this device, which is scary in and of itself, but that's, you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, one interesting thing about this is even if the default passwords have been changed, the default configuration for what to authenticate on the web application does not include the API, which does most of the heavy lifting. The user interface which calls the API is authenticated, but if you know the right way to make the calls, you can just invoke uh, all sorts of fun API functions like, hey, change the FTP credentials to blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's good, and is, this is of course over uh, plain text HTTP, and it's not FTPS or SFTP, it's just, S uh, just FTP. Um, and on top of all that, there's another authentication bypass bug, so even if you change the default configuration in both passwords, you still have an authentication bypass bug. So uh, I talked about retrieving the clear text password via FTP, but um, you can also replace the binaries on the device over FTP. Uh, you can fiddle with the ICS gear that's connected to it in the way that the legitimate administrator would or could. <laughs> um, and uh, if you want, you can also just uh, change the IP address and prevent anybody from being able to connect to it. Um, so here's how the authentication bypass works. Um, what the, the Ilon devices do or did um, before patches were, were, were made available, they looked at the path to see does it, match any, uh, does it match any of the items that I have in the configuration file for the authentication section. So in this case, we're hitting an endpoint that is authenticated by default. So forms, uh, slash form slash echelon slash star is a, a default item. So this falls under that, that pattern, but it's just string-based matching. It doesn't do any sort of canonicalization on the name. So if we instead request slash form slash slash echelon uh, slash anything, it says, okay, this isn't slash form slash echelon. There's another slash here. I don't need to authenticate this. Uh, and then it hits the operating system. The extra slash is thrown away and, well, you know the story from there. An interesting note. The Ilon 600 units uh, have this weird thing called security access mode, which basically means you have to stick a paper clip into this thing and hold it in there as you reset it. So, you know, like either two paper clips or just pull the power and put it back in. Um, so you, um, you have to go through this process in order to put it into a mode where you can change credentials. So uh, you can't really uh, get the plain text uh, if you're just using the authentication bypass, 
Um, and by the way, the default configuration is secure on, or at least we didn't find any problems with the default configuration on the ILON 600, but this authentication bypass works on it. Um, so you can still use all of the, uh, the ICS stuff that they've configured into their ILON 600 when you use this authentication bypass bug, but you can't really change the FTP credentials and backdoor the device or anything like that. But what you can do if you really just want to be a jerk is change the IP address since that's outside of the purview of the security access mode. Now, something interesting that we stumbled across that we weren't looking for as we were doing this research is that the, there was an exploit for the, uh, the default configuration bug that affects the API. Um, and this, this, was, uh, this was interesting to discover. Um, this was posted to get a GitHub gist uh, back in August of 2015. The comments in the code shown here uh, suggest that this is older than three years. Uh, so that's interesting. We contacted Echelon, when we contacted Echelon to disclose the vulnerabilities that we discovered, we also let them know about this. They were unaware of this exploit and they were unaware, aware of the bug that it exploits until we spoke to them. So that's interesting and it tells us uh, something that we normally don't get to know which is that yes there are people looking for these things and finding them and not reporting them. So. This is another one. Can you hear me? Okay. This Battel B2I Hub. What it does, Battel B2I Hub manages communication between connected vehicles and infrastructure, transportation infrastructure. It translates data from multiple sources and protocols using, uh, that are used in transportation. It has a modular infrastructure. The system can help deliver messages that are useful for transportation applications like red light violation, speed warnings, over high warnings. With B2I Hub, it was possible to get, gain access because it has a hard coded password. It has uh, various or different API keys that you can access with authentication or you can bypass. You can perform cross-site scripting attacks, attacks uh, executing SQL injections in the API is also possible. And you can gain access with authentication. With all these flaws, an attacker or adversary can do many things. He can track vehicles, he can send safe fails messages or can change the messages. It can create traffic or modify the database to change something inside the database that may create some different behaviors. Or just shut down the hub so nobody can send or receive messages from the hub. This shows why it is possible to shut down a device that's running between hub because as you can see, it doesn't require any authentication. It doesn't need any API key. B2I Hub has an API, and this API requires a key. Even if the key has been changed, it is possible to access the key through the web server without authentication. As you can see, using a string compare function, comparing to a string that we will see pretty soon what it is. Even if the key file was restricted, the input key, file, uh, the input key and the compare key, or the write key, are compared using the string compare function, which has an odd set of return values uh, in different conditions. As you can see, there is a list of return values that we can use after. They mostly make sense, but something interesting, interesting happens when comparing strings and arrays. The string compare function return 
null with a warning. If this warning is ignored, something can happen here. When zero, the value returned by the function when two strings are identical is compared to null. Remember that we saw the compare function trying to compare the correct key with the input key using that function. The comparison returns true as long as you are not checking types too carefully. This means if you add left square bracket and right square bracket at the end of key and the URL, any key will be the right key. So that means you will have access to the API always. In that case, you can call all the features that the b 2 Hub is using. And lastly, there is a school injection in version three as well in the login page. So you can extract all the usernames and passwords without any authentication. So the final device that we looked at was called the Libellium Meshlium. So the Meshlium is a part of an ecosystem that works on sensors. Uh, these sensors can detect all sorts of things and the Meshlium is actually designed to be able to communicate with even sensors that are not produced by Libellium themselves. They have their own sensor ecosystem called Wasp Moat um, and they are their own set of sensors that they sell that plug into Wasp Moat pretty easily. Um, some examples of these are uh, radiation level sensors and uh, water level se or distance sensors which are used for example in uh, flood prevention by detecting water levels. Um, we have sensors that detect uh, uh, rainfall and wind speed. Um, so depending on what this is used for and we do have some limited information uh, provided through customer case studies about what this is being used for. Uh, for instance, we know that the Spanish government is using these devices to detect uh, radiation levels around nuclear power plants. Um, we know that uh, there is a dam in somewhere in Europe where the Meshlium uh, or the, the wasp moat ecosystem is being used to detect water quality. So um, if you're using a Meshlium, there's some interesting problems there. Um, but the, the Meshlium, it essentially just acts for a, as a hub and a centralized location for storage or to be cat like sort of collected and then passed on. Um, so it takes in data from all these sensors and then passes them to either a database or pushes them up to some cloud platform. Um, so what we found was that there were a number of endpoints on the application that were just missing authentication entirely. So they could be invoked directly uh, and didn't require any username or password. And some of them could actually function cor as a whole, like correctly. Um, some of them couldn't. Um, a, a number of them actually took user input directly and fed it into a shell command um, without any sanitation. So. Uh, if you take a look at the last line here, uh, you can see, and this is, this is pretty much, uh, there's this, I don't remember if this is the start of the file or not, but this is one of the uh, exploitable cases of this. Uh, so if you just put uh, something like, let's say, semicolon rmrf slash in as your link variable, and you have your type variable set to download update, well, interesting things happen. Um, now you might be saying, well, Daniel, um, first of all, no, no preserve root isn't in that example. Okay, okay, pedantic, sure, let's add that. But you're still the web application user, so you're not going to be able to, uh, to do much. Well, I have a solution for you, which involves the fact that the web application has the, uh, the ability to do sudo without any password. So uh, if you just do semicolon sudo rmrf slash no preserve root, well, um, funny or terrible things happen depending on, you know, what side you're on. Um, so uh, we wanted to do a little demonstration. Um, we have uh, a whole dam simulator built into an aquarium based on a Meshlium system. Um, we were not able to use that, so we instead have a backup video, which 
I guess there, we there were AV issues with bringing the dam here, so. So, this is a simulated dam. We have a simulated river, simulated river banks, a couple cars, rock wall, even a scenic view, and a road over the dam. And it's all inside an aquarium. Now, while this is a simulated dam, the vulnerabilities we're about to use are very real. What we've got set up here is a dam with a gate controlled by a Raspberry Pi. And that Raspberry Pi is controlling the water level based on data sent by this ultrasound sensor attached to a live alien plug -in. Now, this is telling us the water level in centimeters distance from the sensor. Now, because of the vulnerabilities in the mesh layer and the fact that this data is being read from the mesh layer, we're going to launch a proof of concept exploit to run a little bit of code on the mesh layer and corrupt that data, making it think that the water level is in fact very low. So the dams are going to open up all the way up, and it's going to stay open no matter how high the water level gets. You can see it reaching the tops of the river banks and now starting to spill over onto the edge of the river bank. And now, on the other side, starting to flood the road. So now that we've Please don't dismay. We worked with the vendors, reported all vulnerabilities. They were all patched. Cities have had weeks to roll out these patches. Everybody has been notified. Um, so that's that's the the positive side of all of this. Um, additionally, you know, I think. When it comes to the implications of things, things, you know, as hackers, we have to ask ourselves, to what lengths do we, independent of the companies who are selling these devices, independent of the cities or the governments that run them, um, want to go to try to find these vulnerabilities? With the V2i hub, it's fairly simple because the code is open source. With the Meshlium, we had to pay 3,000 euros for a Meshlium setup in order to test it. Um, with the Ilons, we got some off eBay used, so it was a bit less expensive. But the point is, these devices are very, very, very expensive, and it can be very difficult for us to get the ability to do the independent security testing that's really required. Um, but as far as the vulnerabilities that we found, here are the implications. Surveillance of connected vehicles, so following a governor around, or a celebrity, or God forbid, even the president. Um, traffic manipulation, causing traffic to slow down industry in the city that you live in. And sabotage of disaster warning systems, similar to the dam demo that we showed you, but for something like radiation monitoring, where you cause a false panic because you set off the sensors and everybody thinks there's radiation, and they start to evacuate. That could be quite bad, right? Um, but after you've finished setting up your city, it's a fully, you know, a smart city place, um, I hope that you are also going to set up your IoT paperclip so that you can reset the device when something goes horribly wrong. I hope also that cities will take into consideration whether or not the devices they purchase have been tested by independent third parties on a regular basis that cities will have their implementations of these devices tested, and that the information about the remediation plan for any vulnerabilities found will be made available to the public so the public can feel safe about what's in their city. 
Thank you so much for coming to our talk.